Sir Harry Biden from Southampton will be talking about um, King Canute and the tides at Southampton. Tides at Southampton, the people who live out here, it's fairly odd. They're also odd at Weymouth and just along this bit of the coast. And uh, that's probably something related to the story about uh, King Canute and the tides. So uh, Harry will uh, talk about that and uh, show how everything fits in. Um, that's a Christmas lecture, and for people who turn up, you might get some mince pies. So <laughs> that's to encourage everyone. Um, I don't think you'll get sherry, you might do it. But anyway, that'll, that'll be our Christmas lecture, and it's on the second uh, Tuesday in December, that's the 14th. And then on the, in January, on the 18th, we have Professor Carl Murray from Queen Mary University of London. He's supposed, he originally was going to give the talk about two years ago, but he was one of the first talks cancelled because of COVID. He's coming back in uh, uh, January, and he'll be talking about Cassini at Saturn, uh, the end of the beginning era, and it's about all the uh, work that was, um, for, for all the information, new science that come out of the Cassini project when it uh, it's Saturn. So that'll be in January. <coughs> the Institute of Physics uh, website is part of it's down at the moment, so the advert about the January talk is not up there yet, but I, I can put it up in the next uh, week or so. Okay, so that's the next two months, and we hope he, more people will come along there. Um, this evening, I'd like to um, introduce Dr. Christian Orr. Um, two years ago, three years ago? That was a while ago, yeah. A while ago, <laughs> a group of us, and many of them are people here tonight, uh, we went to um, Wellhood, and we uh, I had a tour around the dorm at uh, the Diamond Light Source, and Dr. Orr gave us a very interesting talk about his green light, about his beam line. And what was happening there and that uh, stimulated me to give him a call and invite him down and although he's been delayed like everybody else i think he would do was it spring last year sometime yes i think it was yeah last, yeah. last april like that yeah yeah okay um i'm very okay. pleased to at last to welcome you to southampton uh, South salisbury <laughs> okay dr hall thank you very much yeah thank you david um so yeah thank you very much for having me thank you very much for coming and the people on Zoom as well, thank you very much for turning up. Uh, my name's Christian, and um, so I work at Diamond Light Source, which is the UK's national synchrotron. Um, I am a postdoctoral research associate, which is a kind of fancy sound sounding title, but uh, not as fancy as sounding <coughs> Um So I was due to give this talk yeah, in April, 2020, um, and it actually fell on my wife's birthday. Um, so she was very upset that I'd be doing something else rather than uh, taking her out for a meal. Uh, but luckily for her, she got to spend the day with me and every other day for, the, <laughs> for that year as well. So, um, so the way that I'm going to run this talk is I'll do it in roughly three sections. Um, I'll try and slow down a bit. I know I tend to rush a bit with these things, but um, so firstly, I talk about diamond and how it works, what it is the kind of things that we use it for. Then I will talk, uh, I'll give you a kind of crash course in macromolecular crystallography. Um, so I understand here, everyone's got kind of a background in physics. Um, I don't, I apologize for that. Um, I'll use my rudimentary physics to try and try and explain it. Um, and then finally, I'll talk about the beamline that I work on. Uh, which is a long wavelength being my called I-23, and hopefully by the end of the talk that should make sense. And I'm not going to use the laser pointer because it reflects <laughs> quite a bit. Um, so let's see if I can get a laser pointer in here. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so firstly, diamond. Um, just a brief kind of overview of what diamond is. I know some of you have been there. Um, so Diamond is nestled in the Oxfordshire countryside, so kind of 15 miles roughly below Oxford, um, you have a place called Harwell, um, and then this is Harwell campus, so it has things like the European Space Agency, <coughs> Rao Space, um, and a garden centre, uh, but it also has this donut looking thing, and this is Diamond Light Source. So this is the UK's national and only synchrotron. Um, what it is, it's a particle accelerator, so it's an electron accelerator, and it accelerates electrons to roughly just below the speed of light. 
um, and then generates X-rays that are about 10 billion times brighter than the sun in terms of photons. Um, we do this in three kind of three stages roughly. So you have um, here the electron gun, which is a, a linear accelerator to generate the electrons, and then um, a booster ring, also called the accelerator, um, which is where we speed them up. And then we put them into this, which is the storage ring. Um, and then you can also see some of these uh, white boxes that are just out on the tangent to where the beam is. Um, and these are called end stations. So these are beam lines. So that's where the experiments happen. Um, so firstly, the electron gun and the Linac. Um, so it is a high voltage, around about here, down here, is the high voltage cathode. So that's heated under vacuum. And then by thermionic emission, um, it generates electrons. These electrons are about 90 kV when they come, um, just after they come out. These are then accelerated um, using radio frequency cavities um, in the Linac to about 100 MeV. So you can see here roughly how uh, it's very good schematic of how, how these work. Um, you have an oscillating uh, current and you're essentially um, firing the electrons and uh, getting them a little bit more speed. Uh, overall, not that, not that high power um, at 100 MeV in comparison to what we actually use. So the next stage that it goes into is the booster ring. Um, and this is part of the booster ring. So what you're seeing around about here is where it's come from the linear accelerator. Um, and then it joins around about here. So the booster ring is not very big, um, less than I think it's about 50 or 60 meters, something like that. And um, not very big, but this wall is made mainly of these things, which are called dipoles. So they're magnets that bend the electrons around. Um, and so it, they come in at 100 MeV and using more of these radio frequency cavities in a kind of circular motion, um, we accelerate them to three G, so three G electron volts. Then uh, they come into the storage ring. Um, so this is kind of looking on top of the storage ring. So the beam actually is inside um, behind these yellow boxes here. So running from, uh, yeah, that way. So clockwise around here. Um, and this is a kind of schematic to show you how, how they would work. It's not really a ring. Um, it's actually 25 straight sections um, with 50 magnets, bending magnets placed around to bend the um, the path of the electrons. Um, even though the building is much bigger and it looks huge, it's actually only 560 meters circumference. Um, and in comparison, the Large Hadron Collider, um, the one, the particle accelerator that everyone knows is about 26 and a half thousand meters. Um, so we're, we're quite small in comparison. Um, so, the whole of the ring as well, which is kind of, you can see it roughly in here. This isn't a very good photo. On this um, part here, you can kind of see where the, where the electrons are going to be traveling. Um, and then you have lots of magnets to correct and steer the beam. Um, so it travels around here in a vacuum. I think you get about 96 separate bunches of electrons traveling around at a time. Um, so all on the vacuum, one bunch goes round in 0 0.00002 0 0 0 0 0 0 seconds. So pretty quickly. Um, I used to do running laps of the ring after work and it's a joke that I was racing the electrons, but definitely not. Um, if you're standing on top of where the uh, where where it's going round, so roughly standing on about here, um, they're going under your feet. Each individual bunch of electrons is going under your feet about 500,000 times a second. Um, it's enough to go around the Earth 7.5 times per second. Very fast, very close to the speed of light. Um, and the whole ring also includes these things, which are uh, insertion devices. So these are the things that generate 
be really powerful x-rays and all of these magnets here are the ones that keep the electron beam in roughly the right place so they're kind of correcting magnets um, okay so going through some of the things that actually generate the electrons we have um well really three different types um at, at synchrotrons so here you have a uh, bending magnet so i said before that there were 50 bending magnets around the ring. It doesn't mean there are 50 um, bending magnet sources, uh, but some of them are used as um, generators for the X-rays. So you have your electrons going in a straight line, bending magnet here, which turns it round and tangentially out to where um, the electrons were traveling, you get <coughs> um, high power X-rays. So this generates a wavelength spectrum um, roughly in the in the x-ray range and um, it looks a bit like this uh, it's quite a broad spectrum it's not that powerful um, not that bright <coughs> not that brilliant sorry um, the synchrotron term and um, so these are generally used for applications that don't need very high flux and when i say flux what i'm talking about is the number of photons per second per square sentence so per area then we have um, these, which are called wigglers, and they're actually called wigglers. I don't know who gave them that name. Um, but what these essentially, we don't actually have any of these, I don't think. Um, they're, they're kind of stepped magnets um, that create the rough, roughly the same spectrum as a bending magnet, but a little bit more intense. So at each one of the straights that we have, there is the chance for us to put in one of um, these or one of these, so an undulator. Um, and at Diamond, I can't remember exactly how many undulators we have, it's not 25. Um, so there is still space for, for others, I think. Um, and what this is, is essentially a series of stepped magnets. And um, the idea is that where this one just bends the electrons once, what this one will do is kind of change their direction many, many, many times. And each time they change direction, you generate more and more and more X-rays from the same bunch of electrons, um, which means that not only do you get more of these X-ray photons, like the photons per second, you also get a kind of smaller peak of them. And you do this by setting the gap here at which they wiggle or undulate. And then you have these things which are completely different kettle of fish. Um, so I thought I could keep these in, put these in here anyway, because they're really interesting. Uh, they're called free electron lasers. So um, diamond is not a free electron laser. I think there's a, a thought of maybe asking to have uh, or bidding for a free electron laser in the UK at some point in the distant future. Uh, they're very expensive to build. The nearest one to us is the EU XL in Germany, in Hamburg. Um, these produce x-rays in a very very small range a very small um, but it is this many times brighter so it is nine orders of magnitude more photons per second um, and when i'm talking about the number of photons that come out of these sources per second um, so i'm talking about in terms of 10 to the power 12 ish photons per second in a small space, um, which is giving you in the orders of uh, mega, mega gray um, of radiation damage at the sample position. Um, so in comparison, a mouse would be killed by about five gray, um, and we're getting mega gray per second. So they're really, really, really bright, quite dangerous to be in front of, which is why we don't stand in front of them, <laughs> basically. Um, so this is the structure of diamond um, it's separated into these villages so you have your macro molecular crystallography village imaging microscopy village soft and get condensed matter village completely honestly i hardly know anything that happens apart from round about here this is my area so i am in the macro molecular crystallography village um, i believe it's the largest of uh, of the villages of diamond um, i think it also counts for over half the users and um, so also here you can see which ones are called 
uh, I and B, so B for bending magnet, I for insertion device, such as wiggler or undulator. Um, and some of them have even tried to give themselves names, um, but I only realized they had these names after looking at this slide. <laughs> so uh, not, they haven't caught on, I just know that there's I something, and then you also know where to find them because it's not real. Um, so this runs, the synchrotron runs 24 6. We stop um, at 9 a.m. 9, 9 a.m. on Monday. It was a Tuesday. Um, anyway, for 24 hours, and that's for upgrades, machine repair, that kind of thing. So, um, apart from that, there's also three, no, four three week shutdowns in the year. Um, and these are the kind of best times if you were going to visit, because it means you can actually go inside the machine and have a look, um, have a look yourself. The experiments won't be going on. It's also a bit less busy. So, definitely, um, if, you, if you do come have a visit, try and get one of these dates. Um, it costs the taxpayer about as much as a cup of coffee from your favorite coffee shop per year, um, which I believe it has uh, in total um, generated more money than it has, um, has taken in terms of um, scientific research. There's also a plan in the next five years or so to start upgrading diamonds to the next um, to a, a fourth synch generation synchrotron. And essentially what this means is that we'll replace some of these magnets with um, more modern, more powerful magnets and um, upgrade the lattice from a double bend, double bend ACMAT to a double triple bend ACMAT, which means that as much to you as it does to me probably. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it also means that we'll be able to get more of the IDs, so more insertion devices round. Um, so we'll have more things that need higher power applications. Um, so that was your crash course in diamond. And now for a crash course in macromolecular crystallography, which is um, kind of what I did during my uh, undergrad and my PhD. So um, yeah, X-ray crystallography is not a new technique at all. Um, here you have Rosalind Franklin's 1952 um, photo 51, which is the thing that helped um, identify the structure of DNA. Uh, moved on a little bit since then. So now we have these things called um, photon counting detectors, which count the individual numbers of photons that reach each of the, for this, in this case, 12 million pixels. Um, and this particular detector runs at 10, 10 hertz, so it's quite slow because um, it's about 10 years old, but there are newer ones that run at 500 to 1,000 times a second, and they can measure per pixel how many uh, individual X-ray photons have reached it. So to do crystallography, the name suggests you need a crystal. Um, so when I say crystal, I mean a protein crystal, that's the M in uh, MX for macromolecular, and this is essentially what it looks like. Each one of these wiggly things is a protein molecule. And um, by kind of luck and a little bit of science and some skill, um, we're able to take these individual protein molecules in a solution and by precipitating them out in a very controlled manner, get things that look like this. So these are, um, these are protein crystals. So you're probably used to seeing crystals and thinking salt, um, something like that. These are much, much smaller. So this drop here, for example, will be around less than 0 0.01 milliliters. Um, so each of these kind of crystals will be probably around um, 50 micrometers, which is much uh, smaller than the width of a human hair. So they're really, really, really small. And I have got, I've bought some show and tell things as well. So um, those who have turned up in person <laughs> get to have a look at those to see how small these things are. Um, and for the experiment, what we do is grow these, scoop them out with a little loop, um, which I have with me, and then dump them straight into um, liquid nitrogen to flash cool them to keep them at cryogenic temperatures. And from then on, they are kept at about at least minus 180 degrees for the rest of the experiment. Uh, so here is a typical beamline um, setup. So this is I24. 
I'm hoping the sound doesn't fail because it's going to be very loud. Um, so you have here your uh, dewer, uh, just a kind of a vac full of liquid nitrogen where your samples are sitting. A robot to do all the loading for you because you don't want to go in there when your x-rays are on. Um, and then right about here is where all of the magic happens. Um, so it doesn't have sound. This is the robot in action. They're very cool. They're the same things that um, are used for painting cars uh, and assembling cars. Uh, we've just slightly tuned what they're used for. Uh, so the actual experiment itself, um, this is kind of a crystal right on the end of one of our sample maps, which I'll show you um, after the talk. And we have this, which is a um, cryo stream. So it essentially keeps the crystal at cryogenic temperatures while it's out of liquid nitrogen. Um, and then you have probably where this is where your X-ray beam is going to come from. So you have your X-rays coming this way and then your single crystal here, which you rotate during the experiment. And it generates this, which is a diffraction pattern. Um, so here you can see, yeah, this is basically what happens. So the, the, the image is kind of showing you uh, image by image as you're turning. Um, turning your crystal. So with light microscopy, you have your sample um, and then a series of lenses to focus the light back to your eye. So what's actually happening here is you're viewing something that's in real space, in lar largely in reciprocal space, and then focusing it back into real space so that you, you can see it. Same happens with things like um, electron microscopes but they use magnets for their lenses um, however there is no material that you can use to make a x-ray lens um, and so what we have to do is rather than using an actual physical lens we use mathematics so each of these um, uh, diffraction uh, spots that you see on the detector um, is indicative of um, so it has a amplitude so an intensity the thing you cannot get from this is your um, phase and in a um, with any kind of waves you have amplitude and phase for the full information to be understood so this this um, equation down here is essentially uh, something called electron density which is what we're after in the end we want to see where the electrons are in real space. Um, and it depends on the intensities, but it also depends on the phases. And we do not have these. We lose these in the experiment. So I fancy myself an amateur photographer as well sometimes. So these are two pictures I've taken, one of a bee, one of a moon. Um, and to explain to you the importance of phases and why losing them is such a difficult problem that we have to overcome, First, turn them into grayscale, which makes things a lot easier. And then if we do a Fourier transform on these, um, we get the uh, reciprocal space image. If we then take the amplitudes from each of these pictures and introduce the phases from the other picture, so we're giving the moon's phases to the bees' amplitudes and the bees' phases to the moon's amplitudes, you get this. So the B basically turns into the moon and the moon basically turns into the B. And what this is showing is that the phases are absolutely dominating the information content. The reason uh, that this is kind of important for us is that we don't have the phases for the things we want to know. So we call these the unsolved. So we have our solved and our unsolved. This solved one will be something that we know before. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to do a Fourier transform on these to get um, the reciprocal space images. And then if we put the solved phases with the unsolved amplitudes, and the important part here is that these are quite similar. There's a small difference in the ones frowning, ones happy. You get this in reciprocal space, which doesn't really mean anything. But in real space, you get this, which is mostly similar to the solved but you can also just about start to see some of the information that is in your unsolved in terms of 
proteins, which is what we're trying to do. We have our homolog, so and they have to be roughly 50% or more similar in sequence to the one that we're trying to find. We have our diffraction pattern, which is our amplitudes. And what we're going to do is we're going to do uh, put it into reciprocal space and combine the two and hopefully get something that looks roughly like uh, roughly like the first one, but it is a novel structure, it's a new structure. What this actually looks like in uh, real life, you don't get these nice pretty kind of uh, cartoons out straight away, you get something that looks like this. This is called electron density. Um, so this is where the blue mesh is essentially where the electrons are in real space um, surrounding your atom. So then we start to build um, a protein molecule into it. And if you kind of look closely, this is what the end goal is. You get a three-dimensional protein molecule model um, that you can then use for many different things. So why bother doing all this just to get a picture of what something looks like that's too small to see? Intelligent drug design, for example, this is a um, monoclonal antibody, so it's something that's used in the treatment of cancer. And understanding how it works allows you to intelligently design better ones. Um, other things would be better understanding of disease, um, see what things bind to it, uh, see how the body works, and also things like how plants generate energy from light. Um, it's just a general overall better understanding of life, really. Um, so hopefully you are now all experts on macromolecular crystallography. Um, and I will talk a little bit about what um, so the beamline that I work on and some of the um, issues with working uh, with it, some of the difficulties, but also some of the things that we've managed to do um, since it's been in, um, in use. So this is the long wavelength crystallography beamline I-23. Um, so we are insertion device I-23, it's an undulator. The thing that separates this, uh, chris this macromolecular crystallography beamline from other macromolecular crystallography beamlines is that we operate at much longer wavelengths, so lower um, X-ray energies, um, and we work in a vacuum. The reason for the vacuum is the longer wavelength, because at the energies that we start using, um, the air starts to actually absorb the X-rays. So by the time it reaches the detector, there's not much left. So by removing all of the air, no problem. You, all of the signal gets to the essentially giant camera. Um, so yeah, this is a basically a giant camera. It's a 12 million pixel um, detector. Uh, this, I think, when it was uh, when it was first um, first bought, it was around two and a half million, uh, roughly which actually nowadays probably isn't that much for a detector. Um, it's the only one in the world that it has this semi-cylindrical shape. Every other, I'm pretty sure every other uh, macromolecular crystal would be mine has a, a flat detector. Um, and the reason that we have this uh, semi-cylindrical detector is very, very nicely summed up in this, um, this video. So, this is kind of explaining the experiment a bit as well. You have your X-ray beam, your crystal, and your detector. Your beam, uh, your crystal diffracts your X-rays. These are then basically seen as spots, which hopefully will appear here. So this is a diffraction pattern on this. What we do is we go to much longer wavelengths. And with Bragg's law, um, if you change your wavelength and increase it, your angle is going to get much larger. So the idea was you're missing all of these reflections, um, these spots. So rather than build a really, really big detector that's um, going to pick up these really high angle ones, just build one that goes around it. Um, it's not quite as simple as that because all of the software and all of the understanding of um, how to process this data is built around flat detectors. Um, so some of the people who actually designed uh, the software in the beginning and had since retired 
had to kind of come out of retirement and uh, help try and solve this problem. Um, but essentially, what you get is um, a unique beamline in the world um, at which unique experiments can be done. So, uh, another little bit of equations. Um, so, you have something called your scattering factor, which is essentially um, the sum of the atomic form factors. Uh, it's how much the atom scatters um, to produce your Bragg peaks, your um, diffraction spots. And it has both um, dispersive, which are in red, and um, anomalous contributions. Now, most of the time, at most beamlines, um, they use an a NG of about 12 keV, which is um, one angstrom. So 0.1 nanometers is the wavelength of the X-rays. At this wavelength, this whole part of the equation is basically negligible. You can't, it doesn't really have anything at all. So you're not getting any information um, added from here. All of the information is coming from the angle. On I-23, because we go to such long um, wavelengths, these actually have a significant contribution. Uh, so in terms of the actual, what does that look like? It looks like this. So this is a very kind of simplified um, diffraction pattern. And what I've circled in red here and here are, um, they're called bifid pairs. It's essentially the uh, plus and the minus of the pattern. So this would be plus HKL, and it's HKL because it's in reciprocal space. It's the reciprocal space version of X, Y, and Z. Um, and this is minus H minus K minus L. So it's, um, it's basically, it's kind of twin spot, if you want. And in, if this is negligible, these two spots should have the same intensity. Um, this is called Friedel's law. Uh, and it's F H K L equals F minus H minus K minus L. However, in when these are not true, and um, if these, sorry, if these have some significant impact, then this um, law breaks and you will have a difference in intensity between these two spots. Um, and this basically means that the phases are uh, different and you can use that to find your phases um, for only the atoms that give some kind of information to this part of the equation. So if you think in a protein atom, you, uh, in a protein molecule, you have thousands, if not tens, hundreds of thousands of atoms. You could theoretically just try every possible combination of every phase for every atom. Um, you would need a computer from the future and longer than before the Big Bang to do that. Um, but if, it, if you're only using the ones that contribute the anomalous signal, there may only be 20 or 40 or 50, and then it becomes much more of a kind of um, brute force, guess those ones, and uh, kind of try and prove that, what we call the substructure. And this is where the kind of colourful part, the colourful crystallography title comes onto. Um, so, I was saying earlier that um, we have the other MX beam lines and they all operate at these kind of energies up here, uh, these wavelengths. And you can see that this line is the um, F double prime. So this is the one that normally gives, the, gives more um, of a signal to, um, a more of a contribution to the scattering factors. And you can see here, they're all pretty much the same. They're all quite close to, to zero. However, with, uh, similar to how X-ray absorption spectroscopy works, um, all of the energy shells in uh, the atoms have uh, uh, absorption wavelengths. So these are the absorption wavelengths of something like calcium or uh, potassium, chlorine, sulfur, phosphorus, all things that can be found in proteins, and in a lot of cases are very important for the function of proteins. Um, especially things like sulfur, which are actually intrinsic to some to the amino acids in the protein. And what we can essentially do is exploit thing, uh, using wavelengths and collecting data right at the top or 
close to the top of these peaks. Using that, we can um, give a, a value to these two, uh, to these two, if you like, um, which allows us to determine the structure of proteins. Um, so, some of the kind of more colourful um, reasoning behind it. You can do this with quite a lot of different elements, a lot of which um, are very interesting for the proteins. So things like chlorine, sulfur, phosphorus, um, obviously DNA, um, not phosphorus, and then uh, calcium, uh, sorry, potassium in your um, sodium potassium channel ion channels. So for uh, changing the uh, charge voltage, the charge over your cells. Um, sodium and magnesium are very important in a lot of uh, different protein with things like folding and um, active sites. And then some of the strange ones like uh, manganese and iron for things like heme, hemoglobin, um, all very, very important. We've also used some more uh, slightly out outlandish uh, <laughs> elements such as uranium to try uh, phasing um, because this is in this how the peak in that kind of area that we can work in. Uh, so for the last part of the talk, I'm just going to go quickly um, through some of the kind of real world, the, uh, the actual biological effects that these, these have. So this is um, a very lovely illustration uh, of the ribosome. Um, and this is the, the full ribosome here, shown in a kind of cartoon figure. Um, and the ribosome is absolutely massive in terms of proteins. So the ribosome is the thing in your body that's responsible for making other proteins. It's the thing that turns your RNA, reads it, and makes your, your, the, the proteins in your body. So quite an important um, molecular machine. This, in comparison, is a kind of standard, normal-ish sized protein. It's absolutely dwarfed by, by this thing. Um, so what the, the structure of this was already known, so we didn't have to solve the structure. But what we're actually doing here instead is if we go to this part here and collect data, and then right after where it drops off to here, we can look at the differences between them. And in looking at the differences between them, you can see where some of these atoms are and where they aren't. So in this image, you can see lots of these kind of green, um, little diamondy looking things, emerald, I suppose, because they're green. Um, these are all magnesiums. They were all modeled in as magnesiums by the people who originally solved the structure. However, it turns out that around 10 to 20% of them aren't magnesiums, they're um, potassiums. And potassium, the, the kind of chemical um, effect this has on the whole way that the structure works is, um, especially because it happens to be in things like the transferase center and the decoding center. So the kind of biological understanding of how the proteins work wasn't necessarily 100% accurate. Uh, and in identifying them as potassiums instead of magnesiums, we're, we're able to better understand how these things work. Another thing which I kind of touched on just before um, is the potassium transport um, molecules. So, so essentially, this would be going through your cell membrane um, and transporting where uh, transporting things through to generate the charge over the membrane. And what we're able to do here is these things called uh, anomalous difference Fourier maps. And um, in doing so, we were able to locate exactly where these potassium ions were in the channel. Um, and there had been quite a lot of discussion over whether they kind of went in as a one and then another one here, or and kind of went in like a step fashion. Um, and we were able to show that actually, no, they're all in there at the same time. So it's a constant um, travel of these, these uh, atoms. So um, another, it's not all just proteins. Um, so we can also look at RNA and DNA. So this is a um, map of uh, RNA and highlighted in yellow here is our difference, uh, anomalous difference Fourier map, which shows that um, there are some uh, potassium 
Fascins in the middle of it. And this is actually all of the information that we needed to solve the whole, the whole structure. Um, and that made quite a nice picture on the front of the, the journal cover as well um, in the nucleic acids research. And um, people have already, already been mentioning this tonight, uh, but the thing that I23 is probably most famous for is uh, PETAs. So PETAs is a, um, <coughs> also known as the, the plastic eating enzyme, um, was found in, so there were these bacteria living in a, um, that were found in a recycling plant in Japan. Um, and usually they would break down wood-like substances. Um, however, because they had an absolute abundance of um, polyethyl tetra, whatever the full name for it is, PET, uh, which is what makes up plastic bottles, they evolved quite quickly to use this as a food source. Um, However, these are very small bacteria. They don't need much energy to keep going. Um, they weren't breaking it down particularly quickly. So researchers at the uh, University of Portsmouth got hold of this enzyme that is um, responsible for actually breaking down the plastic inside these bacteria. And um, they solved the structure of it. And then they... Um, tried to kind of figure out ways of trying to make it work faster, make it work a bit better. Um, and they kind of went from it taking 500 days um, and they thought maybe we'll increase it by 1.2 times or something like that. Uh, but I think they went down to making it work within five days for um, the same amount of volume. So tiny, tiny um, changes to the kind of shape of the, of the protein, they were able to intelligently engineer these molecules to break down plastic faster. Um, so in terms of uh, research output and how these are scored um, with how much attention they get from the public and how much impact they actually have on people's lives, this is in the top 5% of all research scored by this particular um, thing, which is our, our metric. Um, it has it's in the 99th percentile for things that are that old and uh, of the same source, so very, very highly um, publicised um, piece of work. And uh, to the point where it's actually, hopefully this video works. Yeah, so this is my boss, actually. Uh, this is the beam line that I work on in here. Um, and yeah, that's us doing the search to close the hutch. This uh, is John McGee from Portsmouth. And this is the desk that I actually sit at most days. And my coffee cup, which is on um, BBC's Earthshot Prize, episode five. Um, so yeah, and then this is um, the structure, the map that we use to solve the structure of um, the plastic eating enzyme. So this is kind of, um, you get a massive range of how much impact this has on day-to-day -day life. It can be from things that are very, very, fundamental research, things like the movement of potassium and sodium ions, does it bind here, does it bind there, to things like this breaks down plastic and can solve the um, kind of like the pollution, the plastic pollution problem. Um, and yeah, I was asked earlier a little bit about this, so I, I believe that they have done, so this was about three and a bit years ago, um, and they have been working on other things since then, um, but I don't think we're allowed to say anything about it. Um, but hopefully, they will share that in the next uh, next few months or year. Um, and one last slide that I have, which I was slightly hesitant to um, to actually mention, but I think it's very interesting, um, and it's definitely going to be the future. Um, so all of the every time we solve one of these structures. Um, we put them in something called the protein data bank. So it's a repository with all of the structures that have been solved. And at the moment, there are about, I think it's the other day, 183,000. Quite a lot. So along came a company called DeepMind. Um, and this kind of symbol here might look quite similar to one of your browser icons, maybe. Uh, and that's because the company that owns DeepMind is 
uh, alphabet, as in Google. Um, what they've done is they've taken all of these structures, so the three dimensional structure, the sequence for it is known, so you can get the sequence of a protein very, very, very easily. Um, and they've used machine learning, deep learning, neural networks to go from the string of letters to the three dimensional structure without having to do any of the experiments in the middle, um, which is a very scary thought in terms of is it going to be right or is it going to be wrong? Um, and essentially, it works like this. So, at the beginning, I said the whole solved and unsolved. This would work using, you normally use your solved and your unsolved. Don't need the solved one anymore. There doesn't have to be something that's close to it to be able to, to do it. Instead, you make a kind of deep learning guess of what it's going to look like in the end. And then you take these phases and these amplitudes. Of, so your experimental amplitudes and your non-experimental but machine learning derived phases and get something that hopefully looks like your protein. Um, so this was only released this year. It's already made quite a big impact on um, the structural biology space. And it's actually really exciting to see what will happen with this because it's going to accelerate the rate at which structures are solved. And hopefully it means that people will start to do more kind of unique and in-depth experiments um, that actually look at the function rather than just overall structure. So uh, yeah, it's going to challenge structural biologists to uh, to be more creative. Um, and it feels somewhat like um, when robots kind of replaced factory workers almost. <laughs> um, so lastly, uh, this is just my kind of thank you slide and some of my um, uh, references. Um, so like this is my current uh, group I work in, um, I-23. I and then here is my uh, PhD lab group from Hamburg and Southampton did a, a joint between the two of them. And so, yeah, thank you very much for um, bearing with me <laughs> and happy to take any, any questions. Well, thank you. Um, we have a, a question. Yeah. Is machine learning going to put the diamond light sort out of business? <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it's it's good, but it's not that good. Um, so at the beginning, it kind of grabbed all the low hanging fruit, the things that hadn't been able to be to be solved, um, and then you can immediately kind of go through and you know get those uh, those structures. Um, but we are increasingly finding ones that it doesn't work for. Um, not to say that it won't get better because it is machine learning; it learns from the more that we do, the more it knows. Um, but I think that a lot of it will turn from, we have no idea what this structure looks like to, and, and therefore we can't design a drug on a, a guess to, um, okay, let's do the, do the structure of it, but it's more of a trivial thing than a proper, proper experiment. Um, and that would be for just things like normal kind of drug design. Other um, things such as the ion identification and looking at like what there actually is in the structure apart from the protein itself, um, that won't go away. If anything, I think it will uh, it will ramp up. And the other part that will likely um, kind of rise in popularity is these are all still images essentially. So when you crystallize something, it sits in its lowest energy state. That's how it becomes a crystal. Um, but proteins don't do that. They're very, very weakly. Um, and so what people are doing now is um, taking images of them, um, but doing something to them between two images to make them move so that you can actually see how it functions. Um, and for those, Diamond can do it. Um, but a lot of the time, these are done at these free electron lasers that I, I alluded to earlier. Um, but yeah. It's not dead, and also it's only a small, but not a small, but it's only part of the, the synchrotron. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Other questions? Um, I was very fascinated by the synchrotron. Yeah. And so going back to your first slide, I think okay. it was, <laughs> um, 
and you talked about you know the, the sort of shutdown of the maintenance. Mm -hmm. What material do you use for the um, electron emitter, the copper? So that's copper usually. Oh. Um, yeah, I think it's copper, but it's copper in vacuum, and then you pass quite high current through it, um, which heats it up because it's heated up in vacuum. It, the electrons actually kind of jump out of um, the surface. And then immediately afterwards, you have a anode, so a very um, like polar charge that pulls them out yeah. further. So that's where the initial kind of jolt yeah. of, of speed comes from um, for them. Yeah. And how long would it last? So they, they do last for quite a long time because what we do is um, you take them out at a certain energy. And then you uh, put them around the booster ring to kind of give them more and more and more energy. And these aren't single electrons, they're kind of bunches of billions of them, all kind of evenly spaced out around the ring. So all kind of following each other. And then when they get put into the, um, the main storage ring, the big one, they lose energy every single time they turn because the energy is conserved and given out as x rays. So yeah. it has to come from somewhere. Um, but we have these radio frequency cavities. Uh, positioned around the ring, so every time they kind of go through one thing, they get an extra little boost. Yeah. It doesn't last for the whole time. Um, so what actually happens is the whole synchrotron gets topped up about every, I think it's 300 seconds. Um, so yeah, they, it gets topped up periodically with a new kind of influx of, of electrons. And actually, we some of the beamlines try not to collect any data in that tiny tiny time frame because they can see it on their results you can see this like sudden kind of jump um in energy and um, yeah so that, that's yeah they, they they don't live forever unfortunately <laughs> i've got some kind of image in my mind of it being a bit like an old-fashioned thermionic valve which i'd always understood because an imperfect vacuum didn't live forever am i kind of thinking it's sort of like that kind Those of thing yeah just... yeah they do not live forever you have I think since diamond has has been active, they have changed the source once, maybe twice. Um, so they, they last a while, but definitely not definitely not forever. Yeah. Can I just go back to the question of the solving the protein structures? I'm trying to put it into what little concept I've got of uh, deep mind and how it works. Mm -hmm. So they put all the known um structures that have been decoded their chemical formula in there and they told it what they were or how they decoded it and then it worked out for itself how how one turned into the other how the linear sequence turned into a three-dimensional structure so armed with all this knowledge they've now tried putting in unknown ones and it's produced answers which weren't known before. Is, is that sort of what it's doing? That's exactly it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we collect the data to then check whether or not it's got it right. Because by collecting the, the data, we have experimental data to be able to compare against the um, machine learning structure to see if it's it's not a hundred percent right, but it's enough that we don't have to. Um, kind of do it all the way from the beginning. It's like I mean, a I'm good start. In, uh, say breast cancer, which is now done by AI, mm -hmm. it, isn't it? The, the, the mammogram scans and things like that, where it's sufficiently good that it can be a, a real aid and you can take a lot of the donkey work. It, it does. So, yeah. so it's that order of magnitude rather than being 100%, which it will never be. It, I, it, yeah, I don't, I, that's all the the human beings. Yeah, they? you can never trust um i don't think you can ever trust the machine learning model 100 it's always definitely worth checking it because we have found these um novel structures where it is wildly wrong it just goes down completely wrong gets the wrong wrong idea um but it is only going to get better and it's going to be a huge part of of uh, drug discovery in the future mainly because and i still quite can't quite get my head around this they released the code for free. So just about three months ago, all, uh, everyone in structural biology kind of signed onto their laptop in the morning and found the answer to the problem that's been um, 
plaguing them for the last 50, 60 years. Answered just there, there it is. Um, well, the, the promise of it almost. Um, it, it, was it the code or is it the, I mean, the, the database behind the code, presumably, which you have it's to the use? the database behind the code, but it's also, um, so it uses these neural networks, which are, I do not understand them at all, and I don't know many people probably do, but um, it's kind of what they were made for. It's the best use case that I can think of for a neural net, um, because yeah. there are so many different variables that contribute to how this protein folds that I don't think we could conceptually understand it, but machines kind of, they can, they think in that way. But, well, that's a question I wanted to ask because I got the impression you've got your line going 24 hours a day, which a real problem is the phases. So how much time do you spend on each, you know, how much experiment, it, how much time is spent on getting the, the observations? And then how, how much on yeah fetching the answers or guessing you know so we have a date one data collection for us takes six minutes um and that's actually a very very long time the other beam lines can do it in about seven seconds or so um but we're in a vacuum and when you move things in a vacuum which we have to do uh, it generates heat and you have to get rid of that heat somehow um, and if you let it build up it starts to damage um, damage part damage the protein is the important part. Um, so yeah, we, we typically collect one data set per six minutes and sometimes we'll only need three or four or maybe even just one to be able to solve the structure. Um, and the benefit of that is when you experimentally determine the structure, so you, you experimentally phase it, um, the map that you get given out, that kind of blue mesh is essentially like, it's kind of, perfect almost so you just let a um, algorithm build the model into it it just fills the space and um, so you give it the sequence and it goes like okay that fits there that fits there that fits there when you do it with molecular replacement what you generally have to do is kind of trim parts of it off of the model off that you're putting in because they don't necessarily um kind of uh they don't fit into the data when you do the reverse or transport. So you have it's kind of a feedback cycle, like a iterative loop of refining it. Um, so it tends to be, I mean, I, I've worked on protein structures and they've taken me like half a year of just kind of building a little bit and then refining it and being, okay, yeah, build that little bit more and then we can maybe, and the more accurate your model is, when you do the refinement against the data, more and more of the um, electron density kind of shows up. Okay. So it's a positive feedback um, loop. So it can take away, we can give the user a model and a map that's basically experimentally determined that it's right in a day, whereas they might spend, I don't know, sometimes half a PhD kind of trying to work on it. And then- um, oh, So you can do it in a day then? No. Oh, uh, I mean, I think the fastest we've done is half an hour for, um, that was a, a pharmaceutical company. They were very happy with us because they pay for beam time by the hour. Okay. Can I just go back to um, a little bit earlier than this? <clears throat> you had, what was it, potassium ions trans, uh, it, they were sort of in your picture, one above the other, mm -hmm. and you said you didn't know whether they went in one, three, or one, two, three, four. I didn't quite follow what it was. Are you saying that they're flowing through that structure, or that they're permanently located at that? No, so flowing through, yes. Why did they flow through in anything under the order one, two, three, four? What was the thought there? The thought was that they actually, actually occupied positions one and three, and then they kind of jumped down to positions two and four. So you had two kind of stepping through almost like a gated motion. Um, and that was, it was a, a kind of a opposing argument. Some people said that was definitely this, some people said it's definitely this, but this is the only way that you can say, yes, that is actually how it, how it functions. So they're dynamic, not just static. The, so the problem with, um, with a crystal structure is it is always a snapshot. Um, it is always a kind of free frozen state uh, of the protein because if you try and um, 
So there is something called room temperature crystallography. So you still have to put it, make it, make a crystal, but you don't keep it at minus 180 degrees. You do it all with room temperature. The problem there is that you induce radiation damage in the crystal very, very quickly. Um, and as soon as you induce radiation damage in the crystal, what happens is it photolyzes the water molecules. And about 50% of the crystal is water. Um, and these generate free radicals, which immediately travel to electron sinks. So things like sulfurs or heavier atoms in your structure, and they just break it. And to a point where um, on kind of this slide at the beginning, uh, I showed how the crystal looks. Um, yeah, so it's nicely ordered. And the reason you actually get the, uh, the Bragg reflections is because of the ordering between them. You can't take um, an X-ray diffraction image of just one protein because it wouldn't, there's nothing, you can't see it. And also it would be a line rather than a spot. Um, but when there's lots and lots and lots of them, all in the same orientation or a symmetry related orientation, you get enough signal to image what it looks like. But it is an average of every single one of the billion, billion molecules in there. When you start to do radiation damage, these don't sit nicely like that anymore. They just kind of skew it and go all over the place. And it's something that immediately becomes apparent called uh, mosaicity, how it kind of sits, it's like a mosaic. Um, after a little while, if you kill them, you just don't get any spots. You just get um, a blur <laughs> more than anything. Sorry, I think I might have missed this. But on your graph of Aston and Common, what is it which causes the very sharp transitions in the, uh, in the spectrum? Um, so it is the, the L edge or the K edge of the, um, the actual element. So it's uh, dependent on the number of electrons in the outer shell, basically. Um, so they don't actually only just have that one edge. They have other edges, but they're often way too far one way or the other for us to exploit, which is why on um, this slide here, um, I've only highlighted these ones because these, this kind of from about here to maybe here, within these um, these two uh, rows, that's roughly where we can we have the edges that we can look at. Um, so when you say edge, you mean what type of transition? Or absorption absorption edge. So they absorb um, they absorb the wavelength at that specific. Yeah, they absorb the photons at that specific um, wavelength. Yeah. Um, we also have, <laughs> yeah, I kind of highlighted this in gold because for, I, I feel like that's the, the golden, um, maybe a little bit just out of reach because of how ridiculously similar it is to oxygen, of which there are many in a protein. So um, yeah, that, that's kind of probably around here is the limit that you can actually get to. So. Do, do, do transition metals atoms actually occur naturally or do you put them in? Um, so I've seen palladium used as a kind of part of the part of drug molecules usually. Um, but apart from that, no, they don't really occur in, in nature. The, so before this technique was around, um, you would have your protein molecule and it's kind of chicken or the egg here because I said that you borrow a structure that's already been solved. But how do you have a structure that's already been solved if you can't solve the structure? What they used to do is you used to have your crystal and you would soak it in um, a liquid that contained heavy atoms and just hope that they stuck into specific places. And then you could do that, that you could use that as your, um, because you can access the, um, these edges, but they're much higher up, so you don't need to go all the way down here. And all of the beam lines and all of the kind of data collections are up here in those days. Um, people still do that. They do something called selenomethionine phasing, um, which is where you swap out all of the sulfurs in thiamines for seleniums. And whereas sulfur's edge is 
this green one here, which is really difficult to get to, but any other blue planet. The um, selenium edge is all the way up here, so it's kind of in the, in the range that um, most green ones can get to. Yeah, so they, they don't go naturally, but um, we put them in. <laughs> Thank you. Um, bearing in mind this is a sort of a biological process, my understanding of chemistry goes back to when things were written in long strings of letters and numbers. Mm -hmm. Then we realized things were three dimensional. Then we realized that just having a three dimensional structure also meant you had to encompass folding in something, which is mm -hmm. largely part of what you've been talking about. But these are processes which take place, lots of interactions are happening between various things. And things are being made and things are being destroyed and so on. Mm -hmm. You're presumably only ever getting a snapshot in time of something. So is there an awful lot more work to do for how would these processes interact? I'm thinking of in a different field of catalysis, mm -hmm. which is where you put something in deliberately and it causes something very different to yeah. happen. So you used to do you used to be able to do a PhD and your PhD would be to have a protein and you would solve the crystal structure. And that would be your whole PhD. Nowadays, I, I think I did seven and that was only like a small part of it. And I did all of the biological kind of work on top of it, all of the um, characterization and all this kind of thing as well. So it's, it's turned into, it used to be a discipline and now it's a technique almost. Um, so it's just another tool in the um, in the in the tool belt of biochemists and biologists mm -hmm. to get more of the answer that they are looking for. Um, unless you're like me and you work at synchrotrons, in which case you're interested in making this better for them. Um, so yeah, a lot of what I do uh, for my projects is trying to improve. Um, the quality of the data that comes out. I don't necessarily work on the biological problems. It's more method yeah. development of, of beam, beam lines. Um, yeah. What was your primary degree? Uh, yeah, <laughs> biochemistry. And then, um, so biochemistry, and then a master's in biophysics. That's fun. Could this ever be extended to scattering off a single molecule, single large molecule? I mean, you know, imagining what's it, um, optical wave coming in as a wave front and then it's scattered on all, off all the particular electrons and you get some sort of a transformation. So uh, there is a, uh, not a, it's a complementary technique um, which has gained a lot of traction in the last kind of five, 10 years uh, called cryo-electron microscopy. And that basically that is single particle cryo-electron microscopy. Um, so you have a kind of a flat grid and you have your protein solution and you kind of spray it onto the surface and hope that the protein molecules land roughly kind of dispersed in different orientations. Uh, and then you use a transmission electron microscope to take images of each ind individual one because an electron microscope can go to much higher resolution technically, but not practically. Um, but by taking images of 200,000 individual <coughs> molecules, um, you can put that through a pipeline which uses a lot of machine learning a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, and essentially, builds what you saw there with the electron density, um, but using uh, electrons as the, the, the information carrier rather than x-rays. Um, yeah. It has advantages such as there are lenses, so you don't need to do Fourier transforms on them um, yeah. because you have a condenser lens afterwards. Okay. I mean, it's, it's just, I mean, you know, with high energy physics, you send in a pass called, which could be a gamma ray or something like that, and it scatters and you have these scattering functions. I just wondered whether this you can have a scattering function for these things as well. You know. Um it might it kind of sounds similar to how it's not single particle at the moment, at least, but uh with free electron lasers, yeah. you get close to something like that. So you have um femtosecond pulses rather than a kind of continuous stream of x-rays. Yeah. So you have a crystal 
kind of fly in from the side and then you match it in time with the femtosecond pulse. Um, so femtosecond is one times 10 to the minus 15 seconds, pretty quick. Um, and you hit the crystal with that pulse and you get your diffraction pattern. But in the time that it's taken for the diffraction pattern to then reach the detector, um, it's absolutely annihilated the, um, the crystal. Yeah. But because it's a light wave, it travels faster than the, the just destruction can, can happen. Um, and that's how they do the kind of movies almost kind of thing, because you can, on the way of the crystal coming in, you can hit it with a laser that will activate something to happen within the protein and then hit it with the x-ray and you get the image of what happens just after that. So you can kind of start to understand very, very, very short time scale molecular movements. Okay, that's fabulous. Any other questions? Well, Christian, thank you. <laughs> just, just a comment, really. Well, first of all, thank you so much. I think this is the first live talk we've been through for about two years, and it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, um, there was an article very recently in the Institute of Physics magazine saying that physics graduates, in order to get employment, need to be adaptable and creative and good communicators. And I've just been totally amazed all the areas of science that you're just using as tools. Mm. And you know, it's assumed that you, you're good at all these things. So thank you so much. Hopefully good. I don't know whether it's a uh, um, jack of all trades, master of none. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I, I have certain parts that I understand fully and quite happy that I know a lot about them. and there are other parts that I get the understanding of yeah. and I'm, I use the bits that I can understand but I'm yeah, a lifetime away from really understanding anything really in depth so um, yeah I, maybe I give off the illusion of knowing more than <laughs> Can I just add to what's just been said thank you very much it's fantastic you're very welcome. but having attended these for a few years now it's the thing that continues to surprise me. It's the spectrum of large amounts of knowledge that all of our presenters have. It's notionally physics, but there's all sorts of other subjects that comes into it, which makes it so really intriguing. Yes. Okay, it's been fabulous talk. You're, you're an expert in a huge range of subjects. <laughs> We're all extremely impressed. So thank you very much. <laughs> And, uh, just remind people next price, next time. <laughs> For those that turn up. Okay. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Okay.